This is Control Structure, episode 119 for November 30th, 2016. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes if you are not already looking at them. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs119 to see them. Uh, with you today is your host, Andrew Bailey, and with me today is Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Steve. So, um, you just got filled up on uh, turkey and Thanksgiving food again? I did. I, I got that again. I had a turkey refried bean burrito. It was pretty good. Yeah. Um, as did I, although mine was like twice as big. It was. <laughs> uh, I think like Chipotle has like the same idea, like putting like a whole bunch of turkey stuff into a burrito. I think they call it like a gobblerito or something. So that's a catchy name. Yeah, I haven't really uh, had one of those, but like homemade, like you can't really get better than that. No, no. that was pretty good. So, oh yeah, and is, is my fan uh, making airplane sounds again? Uh, I'm not sure, but I don't want to take any chances. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of lots of stuff happened uh, since we last did the show. Uh, so Trump won, uh, then. Uh, OSU beat Michigan, which is a good thing. Uh, at least for me, that is. So, that happened the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So, like, I was still over at my parents' place, and, uh, uh, it was a, uh, very emotional game. Uh, so, like, Ohio State, we would drive down to the end of the field, and then, like, somehow miss the score, uh, like, OSU somehow missed two field goals. That's pretty bad. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, somehow we managed to hold Michigan back and, you know, uh, catch up. Such that uh, we went into double overtime. So, yeah, that was a uh, pretty uh, heated game. This is the most interesting games, though, when they uh, have a close race all the way to the end. So, uh, yeah. Like, a whole bunch of people are, like, sort of analyzing, like, how it's going to affect the college football playoffs. I don't care. We beat Michigan. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) If if we get the national championship, okay, I I won't say no. There you go. So, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, well, I guess we will get sort of into, uh, uh, like, actual podcast material. Uh, do you work in a feature factory? I think that is probably a very large possibility. Um, I don't think it is because, uh, well, at least for myself, because you know I work in you know a company that does e-commerce software, and you know the main functionality of that is to you know put a product in your cart and to buy whatever is there. So so it's the same thing. Again and again and again. Yeah. And, you know, make sure, like, all the feeds in the back end are running and to make sure that, you know, the payment processor is working and, you know, make sure if anything blows up, fix it. You know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the main signs that you're working in a feature factory is that you're always working on new features. You're never fixing anything. You never really take any kind of feedback of, you know, like how that, uh, uh, how that feature was received uh, or, uh, you know, like the project managers or, you know, uh, how should I say, they really focus on, like, meeting shipment dates and stuff and they don't really think about, like, how things were built. Just build them and, you know, build them and bill them. That's something I've seen a lot is the focus on a shipment date and just getting it done by that date and then... Four months later, you're done working all the bugs out of it. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, I'd have to really think about it, but I don't think that I've ever worked in a feature factory. So, um, yeah. Where I work now, you know, of course, like all of our sites are covered by analytics. So, like, especially with our uh, one client that, you know, they're really concerned about... You know, like this log, not the login page, the registration page that it's, I don't know, like 
20 or 30 fields long, and half of it is marketing questions. I see. So they're trying to gather as much as they can about the end user and yeah. figure out exactly what they need and what they what they want. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, marketing, you know, figure that stuff out on your own. <laughs> so, and this is a company that pretty much analyzes, like, every bit of information that gets punched into the website. <laughs> so do they ever, like, the metrics to track, like, say, if a certain feature isn't being used, they would... Uh take it away just to make it more leaner or is it because it's more pre-baked maybe you don't do that so much uh well right now uh like how should i say i want to say was like maybe sometime last year or earlier this year like the guy wanted to you know make it a one page all in one that you know you could like order some kind of trial and like it would create your account all in one page uh, but now he's like other him and like some other people are thinking that this huge long page of fields is scaring <laughs> people off. Might be. So, uh, yeah, there's there's plenty of reviewing going on there. That's good. So, uh, have you ever reported an issue and uh, you know like sort of like you know explain what was going on or like how to reproduce it and stuff, and then just like stopped caring about it uh i have actually there's an issue with adding a ppa in ubuntu where if you add the same one again it goes and have it and adds another line to the text file it makes and re-adds it and so i went ahead and i posted it someplace on the internet and someone's like ah it's not a big deal it's only a few kilobytes <laughs> and so at that point in time i wasn't willing to argue and fight with people and i just let it slide <laughs> uh or you can use sudo and start changing things it could. It just uh, was annoying that the software would do that. Like, it, seriously, if it already exists in this file you're adding it to, you don't need to add it. Like, it's not that difficult. I think what I actually ended up doing was I had a script that would delete duplicates. So I, I think I was sorting the lines alphabetically and then wiping out anything that was duplicated in there. So I actually did kind of hack it because it did bother me some. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Okay. So, apparently now, there is a company that is creating a add-on chip for the Raspberry Pi to allow you to have uh, LTE internet on it now, so uh, you can have a true IoT without Wi-Fi. This is a kind of a new one for the Raspberry Pis. I haven't really seen any cell phone chips for them before. There's a few other devices out there, I think, I believe, Particle. Uh, they make uh, a version of the pho Photon, I'm not sure what the actual one is, but there's a different version they make that has a cell phone chip right on it, and so you can hook up to the internet to that. Uh, that gives a lot of flexibility, I think, for random things like maybe sitting out in the woods, trial camera that sends you pictures of your monster buck and things like that. So this is, this is my thought. So, so it's deer season right now, right? So we get a whole bunch of these things. There's web cameras. <laughs> I'm going to have them all throughout the woods. Anytime any deer moves, I'll just get a notification, and I'll just look at it, and then I know where the deer is at, see? And I can be watching it, and then I just know right where to go, and problem solved. Uh, or dinner solved. Dinner like. solved. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you mentioned that it is buck season? It is buck season. It opened up on Monday there. So is that rifles, crossbows, archery? It, it's, it's rifle in any weapon below the rifle category, which you would wish to use that's legal to use in other deer seasons. So that would include the ones you mentioned and also muzzle litters and uh, I think that would be the bulk of the, the weapons you can use. There was, this is interesting, a few years back there was a movement where some people wanted to use the spears that you know they had like the angle thing on them and you flip them forwards like it has like a, a an angle? It, it look, it's at an angle when you're launching it. So it's like you have the spear, and then there's like a cup-shaped thing with a stick on the end. And you stick the end of the spear in it, and then you take it and you flick it forwards oh. in order to like shoot the spear out. There was apparently for a while they actually considered making it legal in PA to use those to hunt deer. Huh. That could be kind of fun. I don't think they ever legalized it, though. But yeah, anyways, so I saw a doe last night, and 
uh, had a very nice shot at it, and it was buck season, so I did not shoot it, unfortunately. <laughs> so it lives on. So, um, speaking about this LTE thing, it doesn't exactly say, like, if it'll be, like, a little USB thing that you plug in, or if it'll be, like, one of those GPIO pin things. Yeah, it doesn't seem to mention, I thought maybe it might be a shield at first, but it doesn't really use the word shield in there, so it seems a bit vague. Uh, Ooh, Chris's favorite word. Vagueness. By the way, he mentioned that he would come, that he might come by this evening, but he hasn't shown up yet. So if there's a sudden crash at a door and pounding, it's either the police or Chris. Uh, Chris, because, like, I have no idea why the police would come here. Me neither, but you never know. So maybe they might be looking for Chris. See, that would make sense. <laughs> so if you suddenly hear a lot of shouting in the background. Uh, so, uh, our favorite hard drive uh i guess customer uh backblaze that you know they have released a uh, another a quarterly report as they uh you know i want to say always do uh at least as of late uh something weird happened they have fewer hard drives now than they did a few months ago and what they're basically doing is that since they're buying like all these 8 6 and 4 terabyte drives is that they are retiring their smaller capacity drives, which I'd say is a good thing because, like, in theory, that means lower power consumption and, like, better space utilization. It's it's an interesting thing, and in just sitting here thinking about it, it's actually interesting that they haven't hit this point before because you're saying they're actually increasing their space as they add less hard drives. So, uh, let's see. It seems that the... Uh, the four terabyte Seagate drives aren't really doing all that great, uh, but uh, let's see. It seems like the uh, worst drives to get tend to be the Western Digital ones, mm -hmm. uh, but that's probably because Seagate got a whole lot better. And uh, like the one model uh, of Seagate drive uh, that like just kept on failing a lot had I don't know like a ten or fifteen percent failure rate. It, like, made Seagate look pretty bad. And I wonder if those were the drives that were, like, one of the first off the line after the uh, 2011 Thailand floods. And, that that, sense. and, like, maybe their factory was still a little dirty by the time they turned it back on. <laughs> so, uh, you know, because, like, getting dirt in a hard drive is a very bad thing. It is a bad thing. <laughs> Apparently yelling at it is, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very slightly. So, uh, you remember AMD, uh, AMD, purveyors of CPUs and GPUs? Uh, yes, I have one of their gra chips for graphics in my uh, desktop at home, and maybe even this processor, I think, on the laptop is, let's see here, cat, proc, is proc, I have to start with a P, <laughs> CPU info, and it says I have an a, authentic AMD. An authentic AMD. It's not just an AMD, it's an authentic, <laughs> authentic. one. So, um... You, let's see, this might be a little bit before your time. Do you remember the Athlon 64 processors? I do remember them. Were they kind of like a P4 equivalent? Yes. Uh, like, when those came out, that kind of revolutionized a lot of stuff. Because finally, that uh, the x86 architecture uh, finally supported 64 bits. You know, extending you know the feature set and everything. And also, it was a lot faster than Pentium 4s. Uh, their previous CPUs, I think, were like the Athlon XPs, uh, were, you know, very competitive with the Pentium 4s already, but with the AMD 64s, you know, the Athlon 64s and the Opterons were, like, a lot more faster than that. Um, so it seems that AMD is making some noise over their upcoming Zen architecture, uh, in particular their Summit Ridge uh, CPUs. Uh, they are claiming that they're seeing anywhere from like 30 to 50% better single-threaded performance uh, over the, uh, what, let's see, one of the latest Intel Extreme Edition CPUs, uh, yeah, the 5960X. So... Uh, like they're saying that their top-of-the-line Summit Ridge CPU will only cost $500. Uh, 
and have better performance than uh, Intel's $1,000 extreme CPU. So that's a really good working strategy to make something better and cheaper. That's a sure win. Yeah. So, uh, you know, AMD is kind of, uh, how should I say, exaggerated some performance claims before. Uh, but, you know, I'm willing to hear them out. And if it is anywhere close to what they say in performance, uh, I will be buying them. Like, no question. So, um, yeah, they say that the CPU, at least the higher end SKUs, uh, will be released uh, around sometime in January after CES. So, if you remember how the thing goes, there's Christmas, and you get like all the goody gadgets that you've been wanting all year and for about a week you're happy <laughs> then there's new year's day and the day after is ces so the really good stuff get <laughs> so <laughs> so you're happy for almost a week and then you see the better things that are coming and you're terrible <laughs> <laughs> because all your toys are now old because of unreleased things <laughs> this is good because i got the feeling that the i7s were starting to be a little stagnant uh, not saying that Intel is not doing anything, but it was starting to feel a bit that way, and so it's good to see it switch back and uh, be a challenge for Intel to take back the lead. So, uh, speaking of uh, being stagnant, uh, Intel's consumer CPUs uh, have been quad core for almost ten years, like the you know how should I say not the extreme cpus but like the you know the top of the line i7s mm -hmm. not extreme uh you know they've been quad core for a long time uh they picked up hyper threading along the way so now you can you know shove two threads into a single cpu core uh whereas amd has you know experimented with a few other uh ideas uh but now with this zen architecture uh, the Summit Ridge CPUs, they're planning to have eight physical cores. Uh, and they also figured out their own symmetrical multi-threaded thing, like hyper-threading. So you'll be able to run 16 threads through the CPU. Uh, so, you know, that's going to uh, push, uh, push Intel a little bit more. You know, especially if each one of those cores outperforms Intel's cores, and there are more of them. Yes, Definitely an advantage. So uh, AMD has always been one of those uh, companies that uh, for a while, you know, they've just been very heavy on the multiple cores because, you know, they kind of invested in the, it's like, oh, it's the future. Everything is going to be multi-threaded. But it didn't really turn out quite that way. It's just kind of hard to write threaded software. Sometimes you just have to do things Cereal. one after another. Yeah. You can't. It's like, well, oh, I'm going to bake my cake and mix it and eat it at the same time. It'll be so fast. It will be so fast. <laughs> you know, it takes 20 minutes to cook it, 5 minutes to eat it, and like 30 minutes to mix it up. I, I can get it done in 10 minutes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is great. This is, this is perfect. I'll put an oven in my stomach and a mixer in my stomach, too. I have them surgically implanted. I just eat the ingredients and boom, a cake inside of me. <laughs> So, um, uh, so apparently somewhere along the way, uh, was it Intel or Intel AMD, uh, hired back the guy that made the, uh, the Athlon 64s. Apparently he had been working at, was it PA semi, which were, which was the, uh, company that was making all those Apple iPhone CPUs. Oh, interesting. So, uh, AMD hired him back, and I'm very sure that this Zen architecture is pretty much all that he worked on. There's a guy that uh, obviously is super valuable that they should not let go next time. <laughs> Unfortunately, he left like two years ago. Oh, okay. So he like did his processor, and he's like, see ya, guys. I think I can get better job someplace else. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so... Uh, I'm pretty sure that's, you know, this is what he worked on. Uh, so, you know, I am I want to hope that AMD won't suck for, like, ever. So, uh, yeah, if if it is all that they said that it'll be, it'll be great. So, um, 
I remember reading, I think it might have been on, uh, like, Reddit, that they were saying that they had some nasty bug that was holding their performance back by, like, 30 or 40%. That's quite a bit to be held back by. Yeah, so I'm wondering if they've, like, actually started to fix those. Uh, so, like, maybe that overhead's gone away. Yeah. And if that's so, like, they were already saying that it was, like, faster than the Extreme Edition. So, like, if they remove that, it'll be even faster. And which would be a super good thing. So, yeah, this is something that I will absolutely be watching. So, the one thing that's... Another thing that's annoyed me about AMD CPUs is that they still have pins on them. You know, like, one thing that Intel got right is, you know, no pins on the CPU. It's so easy to bend the things. Yeah. So, like, I remember when, uh, uh, like, Intel uh, did this way back at the end of the Pentium 4 era, is that it's like, well, well, then you would bend your pins on the motherboard and you have to get rid of the motherboard. But then consider, would you rather bend a pin on a $300 CPU or bend a pin on a $100 motherboard? Very true. You know, granted, the motherboard is big and you think it'd be more important, <laughs> but it's actually cheaper. <laughs> yes. Um, so, and if I recall, AMD actually does, uh, does have the pins on the board and, like, no pins on the CPU for their server processors, but not for their, like, regular customer line CPUs. So... And then they, you know, also go over, you know, feature the of the chipset while they're at it. And it seems to, you know, have some fairly standard stuff. One thing that has happened uh, over the past month or so is BlizzCon, which is, uh, you know, the big Warcraft festival that Blizzard Entertainment puts on out in California. Uh, and also a little bit about their other games, too. Uh one of the thing one of the things that you know came out you know among all their you know other announcements this was you know one of the more overlooked ones is that uh blizzard will uh be collaborating with google to uh how should i say make the google deep mind stuff be a better ai for starcraft 2 so like if you always complained about like the ai being kind of stupid uh, well, maybe it might not be so stupid anymore. That is like a classic problem for AI. It's kind of predictable. It does the same thing. And the only way I've seen this in games, the only way they make it harder is, well... We make just... it cheat. Yeah, it cheats better. It just gets better at cheating. And it's like, really? That's that's all you do? Or maybe you just randomly it hits better. It, it, it doesn't play the game. It's just... Stronger. Use... Yeah, it's using the game to its advantage so it can beat you better. <laughs> So, uh, one of the things that, uh, people liked about the original StarCraft is that people kind of figured out where all the memory locations were and created a sort of unofficial API to extend it. So, like, there's been tons of competitions for the original StarCraft, uh, you know, because of that. But, uh, like, originally Blizzard was kind of hesitant to, like, have, like, additional AI you know, sequences or programs running uh, on StarCraft II. Uh, but it looks like they may have changed their minds about that. Uh, or maybe this is, like, kind of some kind of a special version that's, like, not available to everyone. Uh, but uh, they're hoping that uh, the, how should I say, the data and the experience they've gathered with this will translate over into other games and areas as well. So, uh, also... Uh, I'm kind of excited about this because I love StarCraft 2. <laughs> uh, in fact, I am uh, playing the very end of it, the Legacy of the Void, and uh, I hope to have a post up on the blog soon about that. Uh, although the rest of the week looks kind of busy, so uh, don't count on it soonish. So, um, how much of your life do you have in Google? Unfortunately, quite a bit pictures, most of my documents, and all of that. So, uh, pretty much all that I really have is the email. Uh, you know, sure, I do have some documents and photos, but they're, like, not really important. 
uh, unless we're talking about the uh, the Nexus uh, podcast uh, show notes. Uh, so it turns out that uh, Google released a new phone, uh, like I think it was like one of their Pixel phones or something, that uh, people, uh, uh, how should I say, the, I want to say the bastards or the jerks of the internet, you know, how they get on, like when some new piece of hardware is released, they get on and buy all of them. And then they sell them for a profit because there's none left. Yeah. Kind of like the guys that bought all the 22 ammo up a while back. And then there was a run on it. And so you had to pay more money for it because some guys bought all the ammo up because they just wanted to buy it all up. Uh, so uh, a lot of people were uh, a lot, maybe a handful of people, like maybe a hundred or so that uh, uh, they did this and sent it to some address, I think, in New Hampshire or something, uh, to, like, resell their phones. And apparently Google noticed this and suspended all the accounts and other related accounts of people who bought a Pixel phone and sent it to this address in New Hampshire. So suddenly these people try to log on and comes up with a very nice, your Google account has been suspended. Uh, just like without warning. Uh, so like Google saw that these people were sending the phones to a single place and Google suspended the accounts. And the uh, message uh, that Google gave to these people was extremely vague, just saying that you violated our terms of service and we're totally shutting you down. And we're not even allowing you to get any of your data out. Sucks to be you. So, uh, yeah, this has been described as a digital death sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, this post goes over a few uh, lessons that everyone should learn. Don't mess around with Google or any company that you simply can't live without. Uh, Ignorance of the terms is not an excuse, so be sure to read them. And back up your Google data often with Google Takeout. This is very similar to the blog post we did uh, a month or a few months ago about Inbox.com and how they just decided that, hey, we're going to close. And, well, <laughs> we're closing. So all the free accounts. So it seemed to be within a day that Google lifted all those bans. And um, maybe some people have, uh, like, I'm not sure if people have learned the lesson But uh, maybe Google will try to, like, actually tell people, hey, uh, you're not doing a good thing. Stop it. Yeah, it's it's better to give a warning at least. Or, or at the very least, uh, we're shutting you down. Here's all your data. Uh Take it. Goodbye. Yeah, that's fair to do the takeout at the very least. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, how should I say this? You know, make sure that you back up your data, you know, International Backup Awareness Day. Uh, do that often uh, for cloud services that uh, have a lot of your data in them. So uh, also talking about Google, uh, they have joined the .NET Foundation Technical Steering Group. Um, so they Google is basically doing this because they are now supporting uh, .NET in the Google Cloud Platform. So this is kind of like their AWS competitor and their like Windows Azure competitor. Uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully Google will help or at least maybe accelerate the, uh, how should I say, the improvement of .NET tools on Linux. This is interesting because Microsoft, like we just said recently, you know, put the .NET core open for Linux. Now Google's jumping on because .NET really is very good i uh, even the ide is pretty good really yeah there's like the um, that's the only good thing i'm gonna say about microsoft just <laughs> enjoy it anyways beyond that it is really good and i think that could really take off in a lot of areas because sometimes some of the open source tools aren't quite as polished as microsoft has really polished the dotnet framework so um the one thing that's good about microsoft you say yeah the one well, and the other one that well, you're going to read. Well, it seems Maybe. that hell has frozen over yet again because Microsoft has joined the Linux Foundation. So um, in a surprise move, or maybe not so surprising if you realize that uh, Microsoft is the new Google, uh, 
that uh, if you've heard about this little thing called Windows Azure, uh, that is their cloud platform, uh, they've actually started running Linux on that, or at least having the option to run Linux. Uh, so uh, with this, you know, Microsoft wants to, uh, how should I say, go after their customers and, you know, actually do what the customers want them to do, uh, rather than being this sort of exclusive semi-walled ecosystem. Uh, so, like, they they understand that, hey, Linux has uh, some advantages, and people use Linux. Uh, and we want people to, like, put their systems on our servers. So this is kind of inevitable. It's being practical. They're trying to figure out where the money's going to, and they're realizing that companies, it's not always advantageous to have a web server running there all the time, not as much load. Maybe it's better to stick it on the cloud and pay for what you use. And it does make sense, things like that. There's just scalability and the convenience of having, you can just buy what you need from a data center. So um, they have joined as a platinum level uh, member, which, uh, let's see, I'm not exactly sure what platinum uh, means. Uh, like, I guess they might, uh, like, how should I say, they donate or contribute this amount of money per year or something. So it looked like there was a gold level, too, which I assume would be better. And eBay apparently has ouched them along with Google. There's yeah, I think I think platinum is above the gold. You, th you think it's above gold? Yeah. So that means that, that means that Microsoft is beating out Google and the contributions. So that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you must be right the way they've got it structured there. So, um, uh, and uh, some people uh, have some problems with this because Microsoft is kind of known for their embrace, extend, extinguish strategy. But given the fact where Linux is now, that's not going to work. Yeah, it's just... Is that I think Open Office is a fair example. It's like if you, if you mess with people, like fine, we'll fork it. <laughs> yeah, fork you. <laughs> it's now called LibreOffice. Yeah. Goodbye, Open Office. Yeah. Uh, as as a side note, uh, one of the designers at work was like still on uh, Open Office until a few months ago. Then he downloaded LibreOffice, and he's like, whoa, this is so much better. <laughs> he's like, I know, right? That's funny. I actually haven't used LibreOffice for quite a long while, just because I kind of switched to Google Docs. It just is convenient. So, um, you know, granted, there are still, like, a few things about Microsoft in that uh, Android somehow makes them money because they have patents. Yeah, that's kind of a weird one. So, um yeah, that's kind of weird, and maybe they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but if Microsoft extends Linux, uh, they're not going to extinguish it under any kind of circumstance. Uh, because, like, as you know, it's kind of free and open source. Yes. <laughs> I, I've noticed that Ubuntu is just an example of this, but Ubuntu is very careful about not letting non-free stuff into their repositories and things like that. Like, you can go download drivers from your graphics card company, but they don't offer the non-free ones in the repository. You can get the free ones, but the non-free, well, non well, they typically they, don't. I thought they had, like, other repositories for that. You can. You can add them in. They're not stopping you from adding well, another like they PDA. Like, they actually... I want to say, like, they actually host... Uh, like, a, like an entirely okay, I, separate I repository. I think I know what you're talking about. There is, but you have to enable it. It's not out of the box. Uh, I'm trying to think where it would be. Software Center, probably. Probably. So that's not even. Software. Or, or uh... software and updates. I think that's what it looks like. I, I know what you're talking about, and I, I think there is a checkbox for it. Yeah. Uh, free. They're proprietary drivers, but it's a checkbox you check yeah, to turn it on. Yeah. Then software restricted by software or legal issues multiverse. Yes. But by default, out of the box, they make that distinction. That way, you can still get that pure ex Linux experience if you must. Yeah. So, uh, did we talk about uh, SQL Server coming to Linux? I don't know that we have. Yeah. Um, it was also during this little uh, Connect uh, conference 
that uh, Microsoft uh, like officially released some kind of beta package that you can like actually add to your package manager, so you can do something like sudo apt get install SQL Server or that, something. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I've I've seen things. I haven't used the SQL Server very much, but I've seen that it seems to be very easy to spin up like an easy instance on Windows for development and stuff like that. Well, so it's good if they bring. Well, I remember, like, back when I was in college, you know, 2008, 2009, and SQL Server was a pain to install. Like, it opened up this, uh, like, this multi-step installer. Like, it would, you know, check to make sure that, you know, your system is good enough and, like, all these other little compatibilities. And maybe you actually had to install this tool to like make sure that you could actually install a SQL Server, <laughs> install the tool to install the, the thing. And yeah. and I recall there was at least one or two reboots involved. Yeah, it, we shouldn't reboot computers anymore to do software. That's yeah, just and, should be a rule. And that kind of tells me that it's nestled up a little bit too close to the kernel for me. Yeah, it <laughs> does seem to indicate that. So and yes, Windows does have a kernel. <laughs> uh, read up on your operating system architecture uh hey speaking about architecture uh dyn dns is pretty important to my architecture because it is in charge of the andrewbailey.com and because i have verizon as a uh uh provider or internet service provider that they kind of change my ips every once in a while so i need a service that can kind of automate that uh you know, update for me. So that's what Dyn DNS does for me. So, and if you recall, Dyn DNS also had a little uh, denial of service attack uh, like a month or two ago. Uh, but it came out by surprise that Oracle is buying them. Wonder if it was related to the tax, if maybe financially they did worse and they're like, hey guys, you uh, want to buy the sinking ship? Uh, well, this seems to have been going on for quite a while. Okay. So uh, Oracle is kind of interested in their, uh, uh, how to say, like their business offerings. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what will happen. Hopefully they won't uh, destroy it like they did for Sun. <laughs> so, you know, if, if their uh, sign-up page says, contact a uh, sales representative for a quote... Uh, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, even for someone like me, like, for a personal project to, uh, do that, uh, yeah, <laughs> I might be going elsewhere for that. At least there seem to be a firm amount of options these days for DNS. time uh or last time last fringe rather that uh mentioned uh doing like some kind of uh redesign on my website uh on my blog uh hosted at said uh dying dns address uh so uh i finally was able to uh well finally uh quickly so i had the idea there about pulling out you know images from my blog posts and also pulling out the first paragraph of text and sort of making that like a little summary thing, right? Yes, I remember you telling me, but I think you maybe even sent me a mock-up of it. Yes, uh, like I had just like a static uh, page uh, hosted there that, you know, sort of, um, how should I say, just, just like a mock-up that, you know, wasn't exactly dynamic, but kind of demonstrated what I was going Got for. Got the principle going on. Uh, so... Uh, I figured out the regex for that, you know, I'm, and I'm, yes, I'm aware that you're not technically supposed to use regex on HTML, uh, but sometimes the world is messy and you need to resort to such dirty hacks. Um, uh, secondly, I use markdown, so the output is very predictable, so, you know, that's an advantage with that. Um, so... I pulled out the uh, the image and I pulled out the text 
and you know i was able to you know put the title over the image and put gradients over both the image and the text which are slightly different by the way um so the image like i want to like fade it down like halfway sort of to the background color and then fade the text from there down to you know the actual background color it looks very nice i, I like the look it has to it so did you make it live now and all yeah. of them or okay. yeah yeah so as you can see this is kind of um weird since like i have the blog post describing the new design of the blog with a screenshot of the blog <laughs> on the blog <laughs> it's a little confusing screenshot of the blog inside the blog <laughs> i actually was confused by the double menus up at top when i was first looking i didn't pick up on the fact that it's a screenshot of the blog so it's a screenshot of the blog yeah now you can do an article about the previous article and do a screenshot of the screenshot <laughs> of the screenshot of the blog but I don't want to have any kind of blogception here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like the gradient, you only really notice on screenshots of like solid colors. Like you can sort of see here. Uh huh. But even then, it's like not that bad. No. Uh, like you can hardly notice it on the encryption ar article no. there. That when we did, we did that in an article a while back, we were talking about the web designs and using the gradients for for text showing text on images and stuff and that was really impressive to me how effective that is at putting text on an image without messing the text up and without really affecting the image very much that you would ever notice yes. like, like for instance yeah. here uh like on the odyssey of the west you barely even notice the gradient it looks like it should be there yeah so um but then the gradient is actually kind of uh necessary uh, because I will show you here, uh, do the after and then uncheck that. So yeah, that looks like the nineties or something like that. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, the screenshot of, you know, the state of the Andrew Bailey, uh, September, 2016, you know, kind of has that sort of teal background yes. and with the teal text, it's kind of hard <laughs> to read. Plus the, the text inside the text box kind of in a weird way impacts it too so and but once you put the gradient on it oh you can amazing. see it perfectly fine yes um so let's see get back to there um so yeah i needed to do some regex for that and then uh then i implemented full text search uh which was surprisingly easier than i thought uh that's because i had been researching it for a few hours um so uh which, by the way, as an incidental note, uh, like I have a little database designer thing uh -huh. that runs as a plugin to Visual Studio. Oh, nice. Which, up until now, has been housed inside of a, a virtual machine with Windows XP <laughs> that I might run, like, every six months, if that. Uh, so I'm like, hey, Visual Studio is free. Yes. I wonder if this plugin will work with it. I've been... Okay, I'm going to say three good things about Microsoft, actually. I have I I was doing... Uh, for designing 3D models, I was using OpenSCAD recently, which is an all-programmatic way to design models. Can you speak into the Microsoft? Yes, I can speak into the Microsoft. About I'm, Microsoft. About Microsoft, yes. <laughs> just this once, Microsoft. Enjoy. And I used the uh, IDE in Ubuntu for that, and... It's a lot better than G Edit and all the other editors. <laughs> it, it just I don't know why Notepad Plus Plus isn't on Linux, but it's yeah. Anyways, so yes, three good things about Microsoft. So uh, I got that little database designer thing working in Visual Studio. I think it's called like Norma or something. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, so uh, like I put in my uh, little database schema there. I added in another column. Um, and I had to, because apparently Norma doesn't really do the, uh, like, full text search uh, columns. Like, I had to, you know, write another script to change it over to the proper type. Um, but that wasn't really uh, much of a big deal. So, like, the idea is that you uh, create a, uh, how should I say, a full text search vector uh, over the columns that you want to index. So... Like, for example, here, I want the title, the uh, content, and the description of the article to be, like, searched over. 
Um, and also apparently you can also have uh, like a weight to this. Like if you uh, you know want the title to be very important, like if you're searching for something and it shows up in a title, that's a good idea. That might be what you want. Likely. The the TS vector to TS vector function is really cool. I was reading your post there, and it says that it turns things like games, gaming, gamed, gamer, indeed game. Yeah. So then it, it makes it easier to find stuff that's just kind of a slightly different form. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's essentially what full text does. That's the whole idea behind it. That's, you know, uh, like a kind of. You know, because English is one of these Indo-European languages that likes to, uh, I forget, like inflex words and change them depending on how they're used. Uh, like it strips away all of that and like gets down to like the very basic idea. Uh, so another thing that you want to do with your full text search is make a uh, index over this so that when you search for things, it'll be even faster. So like how you have a uh, like an index over your primary key, well, you also have an index over your full text search stuff. Um, so in Postgres, there is like two different ways of doing indexes. Um, I use the, I think it was like the generalized inverted notation or something. And then like there is also like another generalized indexed text or something. Uh, one of them is lossy. So uh, like Postgres, you know, how should I say this? It might give false positives when you search over it. Interesting. But Postgres apparently knows this and will, you know, sort of filter those out. <laughs> like, whoops, got the wrong one. <laughs> so, uh, like the trade-off is that the, uh, generalized inverted, uh, in notation one, uh, is slower to build the index but it's much faster to search. That's like having a cloning machine that sometimes clones two of them, and so it just shoots the extra one. <laughs> so, whereas the other one is very fast to build, so it's good for, like, you know, data that changes often, yeah. but, you know, because of, like, the extra pass over the data, it ends up being a little slower. Hmm. That's interesting. So, and then, uh, because, you know, if you want to actually use this, it might be helpful to, like, automatically update the, uh, uh, this index, or the, uh, search content whenever you update the row in the table. So, uh, I went ahead and made a trigger for that, so I don't really have to worry about, you know, it's like, okay, I updated this, oh, I have to run this other special thing that my ORM doesn't support, uh, in Java, that, you know, uh, oh, what is it? It's not top link. It's Eclipse link. Uh, it doesn't really support the full text search, so mm -hmm. I have to like drop down to you know like bare SQL in order to use this. Uh, so like you know, I don't really want to do that in my web application. Yeah, you know, the database can take care of it. So I made a trigger for that. That makes sense because when you make a post or update a post, big deal if it takes another second, two seconds to do it, if even that. It, and milliseconds. Milliseconds. Okay, so big deal. And when I search it on the website, it's not going to have to, you know, build the index or anything. So that's most of your traffic is reading, not writing or updating. Yeah. So that makes total sense. So, and then to actually search for it, you know, it's, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, there's essentially two, uh, two, two methods to build the query. Uh, one that's like sort of like a simplified one and then another where you can like go all out on ands and ors and stuff uh, but like just for my blog with a simple search box I do the plain simplified one and then there's this really weird double at sign operator <laughs> Query at, at my search data so it's not like an equal it's like at at so it's somehow yeah. telling it's it's a query yeah. TS query type or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so my search data is the column where the indexes are. Yes. So, and then, uh, you know, they, you can actually order stuff. So it has a rank uh, method there. Uh, and I also order things by date. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So, and then I just wired up this little search box up here to that. So you can search, search for Fallout. You can get all the fallout posts. So since it's indexed, the uh, feature two probably should be the searches you type, right? 
Uh, not really. Like, this is just a blog. I don't really have a lot of stuff here, so. <laughs> um, and I just did a search on the Fallout stuff and got things back in 27 milliseconds. Very nice. Which is pretty much average for all the pages on my blog. Okay, so as in, it took as long to find it as it did to just load a page. So I go to a category that I'm not usually in, and that took 28 milliseconds. Yeah, so it's not bad at all. So, and mind you, this is like under like no traffic at all. Yeah, that, that's pretty nice though. So, um, and, but one of the things that kind of bothers me is that like a lot of game names are like actual like separate names they're compound yeah. words so so you know fallout one word this gives you the fallout stuff but fall space out gives you nothing well it gives you something but it does not, not what you're expecting yes or if i search for starcraft with the space it don't do that there's, there's really no way of it to know that so, like, uh, there's, uh, let's see, Postgres can use dictionaries, like, I think, Hunspell dis- dictionaries that, uh, you know, can be used when you build the indexes and stuff. So it looks like I might have to look into how Hunspell dictionaries work in order to break apart these words, if you know what I mean. So this the way they're stored to break them apart when they're stored. Yeah. So, like, when you look up... Oh, I see. So you're taking... So fall out, you find the words fall and out, and realize that fall out is a combination of the two words. Now you know that they're actually... The two combination of the words could mean fall out. Yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, Or I think I might actually have to, like, figure out how the dictionary is built and, like, add, like, extra entries into this and saying that, oh, if you search for you know, border and lands, you know, combine them. And if you search for borderlands, split the word apart. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's probably, that'll be my next thing to okay. do. So That's pretty nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if you want to uh, give us any kind of feedback, you can go ahead and do so on the nexus.tv. And uh, you, can, you can see the link right under our pretty faces uh, to do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it looks like I might be, uh, you know, playing through the rest of StarCraft and, uh, making a blog post about that. And then probably playing through Fallout 4 and, uh, making a post about that also. Uh, hey, two games that are compound words. (laughs) Yes. So, uh... Yeah, I'm, I might get to, uh, getting around to doing that sometime, but... I don't know when, because it doesn't really bother me right now. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Da-da-da. Oh, yeah, the uh, church Christmas party is on Friday. Friday. So I will be uh, getting drinks for that and hanging around there. Um, let's see. And, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not really looking forward to anything much until Crixmix. To Crixmix. <laughs> so, uh... uh I- I have a dough season on uh, Saturday to look for us, too. Oh, so it changes from buck to dough. It adds to it. So I can still shoot the bucks, but I can shoot the doughs, too. Ah. So it just helps in, in finding one. So I've been doing looking forward to that. I've actually started to th- decided to 3D print an RC airplane. So I've been working on that. I'm still working on the CNC machine, just, like, slower, because parts from China take, like, two months to get here. I got my rods from Slovakia the other day. It took them, like, <laughs> two months to get here. The guy was nicer. I was like, hey, so I still haven't seen them. Do you have a tracking number or something? He's like, oh, yeah, here it is. And, I, like, I couldn't make it work on the internet. It's apparently a Slovakian thing. I was like, I could you, like, run it or something? I wasn't able to get it. He's like, oh, yeah, here it is. It's in New York someplace. And it did. It came, like, the day after or something. I was like, okay. But anyways, <laughs> so yeah, that was my uh, my interesting thing there. Uh, so it was not last weekend because that was the Thanksgiving stuff, but the weekend before, uh, I got a new roof. Got a on new my, roof. Yeah, on my place. On your place. So um, yeah, like some guys in a van pulled up uh-huh. and like I noticed like stacks of shingles next to a dumpster in the other driveway. Um so, but, like, my uh, landlord had, you know, 
notified that this would have been happening like several days in advance. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, he never did. So, um, that was like several days before then. Okay. So, um, so in order to escape the pounding, uh-huh. uh, like I was planning on doing this beforehand, but I like kind of completely canvassed the neighborhood uh, because there is a Christmas bluegrass concert going on at the church this Sunday. Um, so I wonder if anyone from around here will come because uh, as far as my knowledge goes, no one around here has been canvassed by the church yet. There's a lot of different places. Yeah, and I must have passed out. I don't know, 200 of these flyers, you know, just like putting them like in storm door handles and stuff mostly. Like, must have been a stack yay thick. That's a good bet. So you handed out that many of them? Yeah. That's that's quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. So. Let's see, you might have given, given that many people. Yeah. So they just do the normal service times or they... Yeah. So um, I will probably be uh, uh, taking video of all of that. So I actually have my... Uh... My Christmas party for my work is on Saturday night, so I may or may not show up on Sunday morning for church. Maybe. Uh, do you like bluegrass? Um, I'm not sure. You never heard bluegrass before? It's I like have, but I can't think of what the type is. It, it's kind of is it kind of like what on Andy Griffith what they'd play with like the uh, the darlings? Is that bl- considered blue gla- bluegrass? Um, maybe because I don't watch TV. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, fair banjos, enough. mandolins, yeah, upright okay. bass, yeah, stuff like that. So, um, I I don't like bluegrass in particular because it was one. It's one of my it's one of my dad's favorite genres. <laughs> so you don't like it, and just and, because, and, and and he's like kind of obnoxious with how he enjoys his music. I see, uh, like several times, like when I was growing up. That, you know, I'd be upstairs doing whatever, and then dad would, you know, throw it on some music, Uh you know, bluegrass, folk, whatever. And, like, he would, like, put it in the stereo, which was almost exactly, you know, underneath uh, where I was upstairs. He would jack up the stereo as loud as it could go. (laughs) Then go out in the garage and do something. Oh, so that he could hear it out in the garage. Yes. (laughs) And not realizing that me and mom are in the house trying to do whatever and suddenly have to deal with, uh, like, all this noise. (sighs) So, but uh, another thing is that uh, it was, must have been, like, back around 97 or 96 or so that uh, my dad found this uh, bluegrass festival down in North Carolina. Okay. Uh, And, uh, let's see. Because my parents are such cheapskates, we did not uh, get into a hotel for this little festival. So so did you camp out in a tent? On an airstrip. On an airstrip, okay. Was it noisy? Uh, Apparently this airport must have been shut down or something at the time. So, yeah... Like, this is, like, music I don't particularly care for in a very uncomfortable environment. <laughs> and this is, like, at the... Sometime in April. So you're not really a camper. I'm not really a camper either. Fair enough. <laughs> and this is, like, in April in the Smoky Mountains. So, like, every morning, everything's wet because of the fog. <laughs> in addition to camping. So, like, we're almost frozen. Being cold, wet, and outdoors is, like, the worst combination. (laughs) So, uh, somehow, my dad conned my mom into doing this again the next year. Um, the third year, mom's like, no, I'm not going. (laughs) And, uh, he asked me, uh, I'm with her. (laughs) I'm not going. You can go with your friends. You know, I don't like bluegrass. Whatever. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. Uh, he's in the past, well, ever since then, he's been back maybe twice. So he must have enjoyed it, though. Yeah. So, and I think he was there the year before, too. So, yeah. He, it's more of an on and off thing, I guess. If you do something all the time, sometimes you get tired of it. It's, if it's every so often, it's more special. So, and, like, I'm not, I'm not sure if he's even really that passionate about it, because in... 
20 years, he's been back twice. So that's not a very good uh, yeah. probability there. That's, that's just more like, yeah, I guess I'd do it. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, I uh, guess we can stop moaning about family. So have a good one. You too.